Good morning and welcome folks. Uh, my name is Jackson Green. I am currently one of the living historians at the Alamo. And this video series is going to be talking about the lives of two men who fancied themselves as brilliant military commanders. As a Texan myself, I know that Santa Ana uh, declared himself to be the Napoleon of the West before he marched onto Texas in 1836. And throughout these next few videos, we're actually going to take a look at the lives of these two men to see if there's any compatibility or comparison between them. And it'll be ultimately up to you, the viewer, to decide whether or not these two have any real aspect to themselves, uh, whether Santana is correct in declaring himself the Napoleon of the West or not. And we will finish the video as well with a look at the different historiography of Santa Ana and Napoleon, just kind of looking at how the two men are viewed up until this point in modern histories and uh, movies. We're going to really take a look at uh, the most recent Alamo movie depicted Santa Ana um, and how the 1970 movie Waterloo depicted Napoleon Bonaparte. Now this first, this first video here is concerning mainly the early lives of these two men. So for instance with Santa Ana we're going to go up to the Mexican War of Independence and the beginnings of his career as a royalist, his, a royalist lieutenant under General Arredondo. Talk a little bit about the Battle of Medina which he was a part of, and the subsequent massacre of the Green Flag Republic rebels, for lack of a better word. Um, I guess a good one would be also filibusters or traitors, depending on how you really want to look at it, invaders. While with Napoleon, we're going to go up to Toulon, uh, which is his first real major success as a military commander. So I hope you guys enjoy. And the first thing that we're going to do, we are going to start off with the true man of the hour, Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte was born in the city of Ayakio in Corsica in 1769, while his father was fighting against a French invasion of the island nation, which at the time kind of fell under uh, the kingdom of Sardinia which is hilarious because in upcoming years, Napoleon will actually be attacking the kingdom of Sardinia as his first step in his Italian campaigns. But that's neither here nor there. It's for the next video. Uh, <laughs> his, his father, Carlo Maria Buenaparte, not long after Napoleon's birth, actually started to work alongside the French as the conquerors of Corsica. Charles, as he called himself after the French invasion, was able to gain a job as a royal assessor and inherited a large house from his uncle. For the first almost 10 years of his life, of which very little is actually known, uh, Napoleon is growing up in what essentially is a position of very low in nobility, approximately a middle class position today before his father sought better for himself and for uh, Napoleon's well-being and his brother Joseph's, his older brother Joseph's lot in life. Uh, and that would have to be away from Corsica. At the age of nine, Napoleon was given a royal scholarship to the military school at Brienne and took to his studies quite well. He became fascinated with the lives of ancient generals like uh, Gaius Julius Caesar, and Alexander the Great, and he wanted to really emulate their lives. Um, he also became fascinated with Anglican history. Believe it or not, this massive uh, man that we consider to be fully French was actually very interested in English history in his early life. And ultimately that helps him kind of feel like he understands the English when he does start fighting against them. Uh, he also takes to mathematics. To a slight extent, Napoleon is a bit of a savant when it comes to math and classical literature. 
In terms of social graces, however, the young Bonaparte was lacking quite severely, in part due to his heavy Corsican accent, which he never really got rid of. Uh, he would speak French, and it would be almost impossible to understand. Now, his other major drawback was that he was an overt Corsican patriot. He loved his home and he had dreams of returning there uh, and freeing it from the hands of the French. And at one point he even tries this. It doesn't really go over too well, but he tries it. His years at Brienne were formative for the mind of the chronic student of history and math that he would eventually excel at. Um, and at the age of 15, his examinations put him on course for life in the army. It was at that point that he was transferred to the École Militaire in Paris, which was his next major move towards that career in the Royal Military of France. Over the course of the following two years, so from 15 years old to 17 years old, he became fascinated with finer mathematics and the engineering of fortifications. So he's really kind of getting in there with the more nitty gritty of the subject of the military application for uh, mathematics. Personally, as a historian, I can't understand that, but uh, he takes to it like fish to water. These two subjects and his excellence with them set him up for a career in what was perceived as the dirtiest and non-aristocratic part of the army, the artillery. At the age of 17, he, became, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant of artillery and transferred to a garrison at the town of Valence. During the time of his commission, Napoleon was never seen carousing with other troops. He was never seen drinking. Uh, whoring about or gambling. Instead, he, one was more likely to find him in his own personal room reading ancient history or worrying about how his mother's financial situation was back in Ayakio. Um, Napoleon showed no real affinity for working alongside of his peers, rather trying to constantly get ahead of them in brilliance. So every chance he got, he would try and overshadow them uh, to push himself further and further forward. It just so happens that while he was stationed in Valence, that the Bastille prison in Paris was stormed and the revolution began within three years of his commission. Napoleon was in Paris at the time and he witnessed firsthand the radicalism of the crowds. Both times at the Tuileries Palace and it really scared him uh, concerning the a power that an unruly mob can have. So he was, from that point on, not really a big fan of outright democracy. Uh, that doesn't stop him from becoming friends with some that are, that are major proponents of democracy, like uh, Maximilien and Augustin Robespierre, and we'll talk about probably in the next video. Within four years of the storming of the Bastille in 1789, King Louis XVI and a multitude of the nobility lose their heads to the revolution, quite literally, which led to a massive coalition of forces that weren't really too happy with the revolution in the first place because they were all absolutist or constitutional monarchies. But now that the monarchy has been beheaded, all of these nations like the Austrians, the Spanish, and the English turn against France for good. Or at least at this point, they turn against France for good. Over those intervening years, Napoleon had tried unsuccessfully to start a rebellion in Corsica. So from 1789 to 1793, he constantly goes back to try and find new ways of 
breaking Corsica apart from France and claiming that it's in the spirit of the revolution because it was the French monarchy that came in and tried to subjugate the Corsican people. That ultimately does not go up over very well. And he is forced with his brother Joseph and his other brother Louis, their sister Paula and their mother to flee Corsica for good. And he will never return to the island of his birth. For the young Bonaparte, probably the biggest note to the future of his success was that he was able to actually court politicians uh, and for the first time retain his commission and was even promoted to the status of uh, full lieutenant after being listed away on leave, AWOL, from the French government as he was trying to mount a rebellion against the French government. Uh, talk about a sly tongue on that one. Uh, the Siege of Toulon is really where he cuts his teeth as an actual field commander. Uh, it began when a section of royalist counter-revolutionaries took the port town and invited an Anglo-Spanish fleet to enter and help guard the royalists from the revolutionary government. The British Navy brought with it only about 2,000 Marines in hopes that there would be a general revolt against the terror committee with the Robespierre at the head. It was known as the Committee of Public Safety at that point. And it was through this governing body that a man named Salicetti and another man named Paul Barras that Napoleon was able to secure a promotion to major and an assignment to the revolutionary forces that were laying siege to Toulon as commander of their artillery section. The situation when he arrived was not really that ideal. He had only two batteries of eight to 10 guns each, so about 16 to 20 cannons at most. Most of these cannon had no ammunition or the ammunition that they had was of the wrong caliber. He immediately got to work. He requisitioned new munitions. He brought in new cannon, brought several artillery officers that he felt were at least middling competent. And he also brought in a large number of horses to help bring in the artillery and the munitions. And that includes several siege guns that he actually was able to grab from other locations. Within two months, the forces besieging Toulon had about 90 new cannon, including those siege guns that I mentioned. So they no longer just have small three, pounder, six pounder. If you want a little bit more information on that, I do highly suggest you check out my friend uh, Zach Wollstone's video, The Texian Historian on Artillery. It's a two-part section. But these siege guns are now 24 pounder or 32 pounder, so they can blast through just about anything and they have well over two miles, maybe up to four or five miles of range. He said the city could fall in a week, but had political generals. So a lot of the men that were actually commanding Napoleon at this point were not military men. A lot of the military men had come from the aristocracy, which was, according to the Robespierre Jacobite government, Jacobin government, um, excuse me, a little bit of a slip there. The aristocracy was not to be trusted. So a lot of really good commanders had been pulled off the line. Uh, one such man that Napoleon had to face was not even in a local militia. He was a doctor. He was a dentist. And he was trying to act the part of a general trying to command Napoleon, a man who studied artillery how to place the artillery and what needs to be done. Napoleon actually became so frustrated with the first two men that he convinced both his political supporters, so both Salicetti and Barras, to have them removed. General Jean-Francois Dugomier was then put on as the actual commander of the garrison besieging Toulon. And he was one of those aristocrats who, by sheer 
luck would have it, had survived the terror, was currently not in prison. And he recognized that Napoleon had a bright mind. So he basically gave him free reign over what was going to happen in terms of the siege at Toulon. In late November and early December, Napoleon sighted his cannon in to act as counter batteries against the British and Royalist guns. He turned some of the larger siege cannon uh, to hit the English and Spanish fleet that was still in the port to try and run off the support before mounting an assault. When the assaults were planned, so the final actual movement into Toulon by the uh, French government forces, Napoleon decided to focus on the batteries on La L'Aiguillette. I know I probably just butchered the French. Uh, but it was a large point overlooking the harbor, stationed with a number of British cannon. He put one of the outlying forts called Mulgrave and a crossfire and began the assault with a massive bombardment. And then he himself actually leads the attack on that earlier point, that earlier fortification of Legoulette. Legoulette. With his success at Toulon on December 22nd, Napoleon was promoted yet again, uh, this time to the rank of Brigadier General, uh, and he was only 25 years old at that point. Now we're on to the next part of the video. Uh, this one is going to concern the early life of Antonio de Padua, Maria Severino, Lopez de Santa Ana y Perez de Labron. Try saying that one time fast. He was born on February the 21st, 1794, to a middle-class family in Jalapa, not far from Veracruz, Mexico. The Santa Ana family did not carry the moniker of De, which gave it more of a nobility when Santa Ana was born in 94. His uncle held very minor appointments in the Spanish royal government of Mexico. His family was far more interested in succeeding in the colonial system uh, that was already in place rather than trying to start uh, subverting and overthrowing Spanish rule, which I'm sure was probably quite commonplace in the late mid to late 1790s. It, changes quite quickly for most people in the poorer parts of Mexico and in uh, Mexico City itself even. When he was a teenager, Antonio Lopez spent most of his time in the port town of Veracruz. In these early years, he met and created ties with the economic elites, some of the industrialists, merchants, which would aid him later in political and personal life. His father, in order to keep his wild impulses under check and to improve their own personal economic lot, tried to apprentice Antonio as a shopkeeper with the Cos family business in Veracruz. Yes, it's the same Cos, uh, the family that produces Martin Perfecto de Cos, who will end up becoming one of the Mexican commanders in the 1830s Texas Revolution. Instead, Santa Ana finds shopkeeping to be a boring enterprise, and he asked his father's permission and received, received it to join the fixed regiment of Veracruz. When he was 16 years old, he was commissioned a lieutenant of the regiment. At that same time as his commission as a lieutenant, the Mexican Revolution begins, with Father Miguel Hidalgo giving the cry of Dolores. The movement was to fight against, originally against social injustice and to demand the revelation of economic and religious reforms from Spain itself. The Creole population originally supported Hidalgo until the bands of the natives started to be a little bit more fully anti-European. Uh, it doesn't really work well for 
you if you are a Creole, because you're not really European, but you don't look the same as a Mexican. You still are extremely white, so a lot of their property was damaged. And that sent a lot of fear into the Creole uh, population, especially of areas that were of high commercial importance, like Veracruz and Jalapa. Uh, but because most of them were already kind of trading well with each other uh, between the natives, the mestizos, and the Creoles and the Europeans, the region was actually spared a lot of the terrors and horrors of the revolution early on. Santa Ana even saw very, very little direct trouble caused by the War for Independence because for the first five years, he was deployed to the states of Tamaulipas and Texas. His regiment had been assigned to the forces under General Jose Joaquin de Arredondo. Until 1815, their primary focus was to quell natives in northern Mexico, particularly the problematic, let's say, Comanche and Apache. The big difference that Santa Ana experienced, the big actual struggle that he had, wasn't really much of one. It was known as the Green Flag Republic, when a filibuster expedition from the United States entered into Texas. The revolt began in 1813 under the leadership of uh, the filibuster's head, Augustus McGee, and Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara, who, were, who was a uh, Tejano who had invited the people from the United States to come in, hoping that they might be able to split off and create more of a bargaining power for themselves within the Mexican government, or within their own government, if the Mexican government or the Spanish crown, whichever ended up winning this war for independence, didn't uh, want to play ball, as it were. Lara and McGee captured the town of San Antonio de Bejar and called for the independence of Texas, the outright freedom of Texas away from the United States, away from Spanish Mexico, away from the nascent Mexican revolt. Arredondo's army of about 635 infantry and a little over 1,200 cavalry came out and fought against the 1,400 militia in what is known as the Battle of Medina on August 18, 1813. The battle lasted about four hours. The militia were quick, were put to flight by the end of it, and those that were captured were executed right there on the spot. It was per the order of General Arredondo, who was very much in the idea of Machiavelli, I would rather be feared rather than loved. Um, because fear, you can keep instilling fear. If a group of people lose their love for you, well, you can't really get that back. Suspected sympathizers in the town of Bejar were also brought out and executed by the Spanish government forces. And this made a mark on the then 19-year-old Antonio Lopez de Santana's mind and taught him to be more Machiavellian. He really took this lesson to heart for those who would stand against him. Santana was also known as a bit of a rapscallion. Uh, he ran up a massive debt gambling in San Antonio among other officers and the common soldiers. He even was caught forging the signature of Arredondo and a couple of other high-ranking officers to give him loans out of the companies and battalions chest so that he could pay his debts. For that particular thing, he was court-martialed, uh, but nothing really came of it. In late 1815, Santana returned to Veracruz and became the personal favorite of the royalist governor, Jose Davila. Due to his political connection, Santana is placed at the head of the anti guerrilla forces along the Jalapa at Veracruz Road. With just about 30 Lancers on his first foray, he was able to capture one of the leading rebel chieftains, and the success 
put him in a command in command of the whole unit. A three-day expedition later on in October of 1816 led to yet another uh, capture of a Guria captain. He constantly won victories against the insurgents, despite being handicapped by a political rival named Jose Rincon. Jose and Manuel Rincon uh, become basically thorns in his side for the rest of his life. But to overrule his de facto commander, Santana went over his head. So he went over Jose Rincon's head to the government or the Spanish governor as it stood at the time actually, that Rincon should be thrown out of command. He was known to lead from the front, Santana was, and was a very persuasive speaker even being able to convince some of the rebels to join him and his royalist forces. It's not necessarily that they joined the royalist cause, but they joined with him. At least that's the way that uh, Fowler decides to describe it in one of my main sources here, which is uh, called With Santana in Mexico, or Santana of Mexico, actually. If you get the chance, it is a very good book. Uh, he's very lenient towards Santana at times, so take some of what he says with a grain of salt and maybe look into a couple of the campaigns yourself. Uh, Santana not being on the front lines against the insurgents at first would actually be a benefit for him to, because he was then able to befriend both the rebels and royalists. He eventually joins the ranks of the rebels, like with most of his contemporaries as the war turned against the Spanish crown forces. The major shift came to supporting the rebels as the Creoles were hit economically because of lost trade with Cuba and fellow Mexicans. The official Creole subscription to the cause of independence came with Agustin de Iturbide, and Vincento Guerrero's plan of Iguala. And we'll talk about that in the next video to come. Um, now, for the actual kind of comparison of their early lives section. This is the interpretation part of the video. So what I told you all before, the everything except the introduction, the tales of Napoleon and the tales of Santana, what they've done up to this point has been mostly fact with a little bit of uh, interpret to it. I tried to end this part with two, the two protagonists of being about the same age. That will not continue as we go further, okay? Uh, Napoleon does a lot more stuff in a lot shorter time. By the time of his death in 1824, Napoleon is only about 55, or he's heading to 55. By the time of Santana's death in 1876, he's an 82-year-old man. Uh, so a big difference just in terms of years of their lives. Um, and a lot of what Santana does is spread throughout that life, more so than Napoleon, who's very hit and miss uh, campaign one campaign after another never really stops or slows down. Even by 27 years old, Santana had not raised himself above being a first lieutenant. Meanwhile, Napoleon earned his generalship by the age of 25. Napoleon also grew up in a military school and learned the trade, while Santana actually had no formalized military training. Both men grew up without a silver spoon in their mouths and rose to prominence out of nothing. Both men were adept at using connections to influence events for them for their own manner, uh, for their own purposes. They both show an affinity for leading their troops from the front. So like with Napoleon at La Goulette and Santana as he went out against the Correas in southern South Central Mexico, thereabouts. And they also shared in the privations of 
war with their men. Uh, so if Santana's men were not eating, he wasn't eating. This doesn't necessarily continue for him as he becomes president. Uh, about that I'll be talking about in the next video. Uh, Napoleon, though, at Toulon was known to actually be sleeping next to his cannon. Uh, so he helped inspire the men that he was fighting alongside because, hey, this commanding officer, he's not just there. He's not taking his rank as a jump. Instead, he is here with us. He's one of our guys. And that'll even become a uh, bit of a slight against Napoleon, as he'll be known as the Little Corporal after the Italian campaigns in English propaganda. So I hope you guys enjoyed this first part of the comparison of Santana and Napoleon video. In the next one, we will be looking at another triumph for both of these men and one of their biggest failures. For Santana, we will look at his change of allegiance in the Mexican War for Independence all the way up to the end of the Texas Revolution. And whereas for Napoleon, we will look at the Italian campaign uh, to the end of his attack on Egypt and the Ottoman Empire. So I uh, hope to see you guys back here for the next video. And until then, vive l'empereur.